Okay, um, I think we can go. So hello everyone, welcome to the uh, Introducing Sensor Cell Optical Tweezers for Mechanical Biology webinar. My name is Nesha, I'm the Sales Application Engineer at Axiom Optics, and I'm here with uh, Arno, uh, who is the Chief uh, Technical Officer at Impetex, and Hi. also who is the Chief Executive Officer at Impetex. Hello. So as the outline of uh, this webinar, I will start with a brief introduction of Axiom Optics, who is the U.S. distributor of Impetex, and then pass the word to Oriol, who will present the system and talk about the applications, and we will conclude with a Q&A session. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat window. We will answer them directly or during the Q&A session. So uh, Axiom Optics is a North American distributor of optical instrumentation. Uh, we have offices in California, headquarters in Boston, and lab space in Somerville. Uh, we have a business unit dedicated to microscopy, and we're three people in that unit. Uh, Philip, who's our co-founder, and I are located at East Coast. Vincent, uh, who is a sales application engineer, is located at West Coast. Um, we have a, bus um, a business unit uh, dedicated to microscopy, and here's our product portfolio. We specialize in um, light microscopy add-ons. We offer um, a, confocal a risk scan confocal microscope from Confocal NL, which can transform your wide field to an enhanced laser scanning confocal unit. We have an adaptive optics add-on from Imagine Optic for single molecule localization microscopy and single particle tracking applications. We have a camera-based uh, flim system, which is Toggle from Lambert Instruments. And um, of course, we have the optical tweezers from Impetex. In addition to our, um, our microscopy product portfolio, we also support micro um, microscopy with other microscopy tools, such as cameras. We have a CMOS camera from Tuxin. We have SMOS cameras from Hamamatsu. Uh, we have high flow from uh, Lambert Instruments for applications requiring high speed and high sensitivity. And we offer Argolite uh, quality control solutions, uh, which are dedicated to fluorescence microscope. Now I will pass the word to Oriol, who would be presenting uh, the sensor cell system. Thank you, Nessie. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I will share my screen in order to show you the presentation. So, okay, you should be seeing it right now. Um, well, um, that's the outline of my talk. I will first uh, introduce the company very briefly, just one slide. And I will next speak about the basics of optical tweezers and how uh, force measurements are performed with optical tweezers. Next, I will introduce the sensor cell system. I will show you how the system and the software looks like, and I will show you some features. And next, we will see some application examples. And finally, we will end with a summary of the system highlights. Okay, so uh, very briefly, we are Impetux. We are based in Barcelona. We were founded in 2012. And we are a team of physicists, engineers, and biologists. And we are the only optical users company in the market that is specialized in cell applications. I will go to the details later, but for now, I will just mention that we have a distinctive and patented technology that allows us to work inside cells and tissues where others cannot. Okay, so let's talk about optical users. Uh, these are the basics uh, for those who are not familiar with the technique. An optical tweezer, an optical trap, is just a laser beam of light that is uh, focalized with an objective. And at the uh, focus, the radiation pressure of light can exert forces that are similar to those governing the microscopic scale. If you use high numerical aperture lenses, these forces become attractive, and then you have an optical trap. So you can trap microscopic objects and manipulate them, like this example that I am showing you, taken with our system. In the upper video, you can see E. coli bacteria, and we use two optical traps per bacteria to orientate them in space. And in the bottom video, you can see the manipulation of a lymphocyte cell. This uh, technology, the optical tweezers, were invented by Arthur Ashkin in the 70s. 
and he was awarded the Physics Nobel Prize in 2018 for the optical tweezers and their application to biological systems. Okay, but we can not only manipulate things with optical tweezers, but we can also measure forces. So I am going to show you how force measurements are done um, with this example, okay? Um, force measurements are usually measured with an indirect method, okay? In this example, you can see here a molecule. Uh, it's a folded molecule. The molecule is attached uh, from both ends to uh, microspheres. These microspheres are optically trapped with two optical traps. And initially, the microspheres are centered with the optical traps. Uh, the force that you read is zero. When you move one trap away from the other, uh, the uh, molecule is stretched. There is some tension here. The microspheres will move away from the optical trap center and you will read a force, okay? And this force will be proportional to the displacement of the, micros of the microsphere respect to the uh, optical trap position following this linear equation. So it's basically a tensiometer model uh, where you follow Hooke's law. And in order to get the force, you need to track the particle position using uh, video tracking or back focal plane interferometry. And you also need to know this constant of proportionality kappa, which is also known as trap stiffness. So the first thing that we can see is that uh, in order to apply this method, we first need to calibrate the system in order to know kappa the trap stiffness. But um, some problems arise here because uh, kappa trap stiffness will vary depending on the sample and the medium conditions. So if you change your experimental conditions, you will need to recalibrate the system again to get a proper value of the force. Furthermore, this uh, indirect method is only valid for microspheres or spherical objects. And it's basically limited to in vitro conditions. It cannot be applied inside complex media like uh, cells or tissues. So this is what other commercial systems do to measure forces. But uh, we use a different approach. We do not use an indirect method to get the force. We use a direct method to get the force. It's known as light momentum method. And I will show you how it works with uh, this simulation here, OK? Um, so here we have a trapped microsphere. This is the uh, focus of our optical trap. And you can see that uh, the incident beam of light and the transmitted beam of light are symmetric. And that the mean direction of propagation is pointing upwards for both uh, the incident and the transmitted beam. But here, uh, the trap is centered, the microsphere is centered, and we get a zero force. But what happens if we apply an external force you can see now that the transmitted cone of light is not symmetric anymore, but the intensity depends on the angle. Uh, and as you can see, the mean direction of the propagation of light has now changed by a certain angle theta, meaning that there has been a change in the momentum of this light, and meaning that there has been an exchange of momentum between the light, the laser light, and the particle. And uh, this gives, by a basic principle of physics, this gives rise to a force, which is indeed the optical trapping force that will try to compensate this external force here, okay? So if you can somehow uh, look at the this pattern of light here and uh, measure these momentum light changes, you can have a direct route to the force. And this is what we do. Uh, this method was initially proposed by Stephen Schmidt and Carlos Bustamante from Berkeley. And they use this method in a, an optical trapping system with a two laser configuration where the two laser had a contact propagation uh, in, uh, configuration, okay? Uh, our contribution has been to demonstrate that uh, this momentum method can be applied to an optical user system with just one laser. And this is what we have patented and it is, this is what we have uh, protected. So this method has several advantages. First, you are not applying any tensiometer model, so you don't need any calibration prior to your measurements. Uh, furthermore, since it's a direct method, it's independent of the sample and medium properties. You can measure forces not only on spherical objects, but also on irregular objects. And more importantly, 
you can use this method to measure forces in in vitro and in vivo conditions, meaning that you can now measure inside cells and tissues. So this is where our core technology lies, our direct force sensor. And this scheme uh, shows you how it works like. We have the laser coming back from the back port of the microscope. It enters the objective and it's focalized into this microchamber. Inside the microchamber, we have our sample, in this case, some adherent cells. And we are now trapping here, for instance, a vesicle or an organelle. Okay? So we will now capture all the transmitted light with our force sensor that is located here. The transmitted light will be captured by this condenser lens that we are using, and the light will be brought to our detector at the back focal plane. This detector will analyze the light patterns here, and it will uh, give us a direct measurement of the uh, changes in the light momentum, and therefore it will give us a direct measurement of the force we are applying on this trapped vesicle. So this is the principle, and the key message here is double. The first thing is that uh, with our technologies, uh, the users do not need to calibrate never to uh, measure forces, and these forces can be measured inside cells and tissues. So now let's talk about the system. I, the system is called sensor cell. It's basically two models. From one side, we have the optical manipulation model. This is what generates the optical traps. And here we have the force detection model. These models are both accessories to an optical microscope. And this is how it looks like when installed. OK, this is the complete system. Here we have the force sensor, the optical model. This is the electronics and the laser. And you can see here the optical model attached to the uh, column, to the back part of the microscope. Here's the laser fiber. And these cables control the optics that will generate the optical tracks. And in here, you can see the force detection model. The force sensor substitutes the condenser lens of the microscope, but it maintains the imaging capabilities of the, of the microscope because it lets the light go through. This is how the software looks like. It's called Lightase, and it's based on two different languages. From one side, we have LabVIEW. Uh, uh, software uh, based on LabVIEW that controls all the sensor cell features. Here's the main panel with all the menus to control the system. And here is a LabVIEW project where we can find functions that the users can use to build their own routines. Okay, We have custom built-in built routines, but users can also uh, make their own routines using the, our software development kit library. And from the other side, we have the camera control software. Uh, it's based on Micromanager, okay, uh, which I assume most of you know. And these two uh, softwares communicate with each other. So you can now control the sensor cell system by interacting directly on this uh, camera imaging window. I will show you now how it looks, how it works. So let's now show you how we can generate an optical trap and trap a microsphere in water, OK? This is the most basic form of optical trapping you can do with the system. You click on the screen, you, an optical trap is generated. This is this red cross here, and you trap this microsphere. We will now generate a second trap, trap this microsphere here. And now we will drag the mouse cursor to move it around, OK? You do it manually, and this is the simplest form uh, to, to trap uh, uh, an object uh, using the system, OK? But you can do more than that. You can, uh, for instance, uh, program arbitrary trajectories. Um, so you can generate your trajectories, and then you can apply them on several particles. In this case, I am showing you an example where uh, we are imposing a star-shaped trajectory, but you can do any trajectories you want. Um, in order to predefine your trajectories, you can do it in two ways. First, you need to go to the Tools menu and select Trajectories. This window appears. And now here, you can enter all the space and time coordinates and launch the trajectory. Or you can load a file where you have previously entered all these coordinates. So if you have a trajectory that you want to use many times, you can just load your file here. You can combine 
different manipulation modes. Uh, we have a tool that allows you to apply an oscillation. You can choose the frequency, the waveform, the amplitude. So now here we'll start an oscillation on this particle here, and now we will apply a trajectory. In this case, it's a linear trajectory, and we will combine this with the click and drag mode. Okay, so the trajectory has a back and forth movement, it comes back, and now we will just stop the oscillation. In order to show you the complexity and the flexibility of the system in terms of manipulation, I want to show you this uh, feature, this built-in routine. It's a pattern morphing. Uh, here we have 16 trap microspheres, and we have entered the space and time coordinates for different patterns, and the system will move from one pattern to another. OK, um, this might seem like a fancy feature, but it was asked by some clients who were working in liquid crystal physics, biofilms, bacteria motility, and uh, therefore we decided to, to build uh, this routine for them. OK, but you can not only manipulate small things, but you can measure the forces you are exerting on them. So in order to do this, the software gives you two different windows where you can track uh, the force and the trap position for the X and Y coordinates. And you can select the trap number here. Here we have an example with four different traps. We have three different particles here oscillating in different directions. And in the fourth trap, we have nothing trap. So you can see here that we are plotting the force in the y direction for trap number one. We have this particle oscillation here. And you can see the triangular oscillation here in the y direction. And this is the force signal for the back and forth movement. OK, you can see the same here for trap number two. And now I will change here to, not, to trap number one to trap number three. And you can see that the force here is 0 because we are looking at the y direction of the force. And trap number three, the particle is oscillating in the x direction. The same happens here. We are looking now at trap number two, uh, where we have this particle oscillating in the x direction. We are looking at the x for here. But when we look here at trap number four, we get zero signal. OK, it's very simple. So you can track the particle uh, position, and you can track the force uh, at real time. But you can, of course, save the data uh, for your analysis later. You can also uh, build your routines with our software development kit. To do so, you need to go to this LabVIEW project window. You start a new LabVIEW uh, function, and a new LabVIEW BI. You start sequence. And now you can go to this menu here, where you can see the library of our functions. And here you can find all the functions you need to control the system. So you can use the, these functions to apply oscillations, trajectories, uh, to apply a force clamping, for instance. So now you just need to select the functions that you want and drag them into your sequence in order to generate your own uh, LabVIEW uh, sub-BI. OK? Um, and so if you are interested in programming a specific experiment, you can do it this way. And we can help you to, to do that. We have, uh, uh, we have also some examples in the library. OK, so let's now talk about the application examples. I will show you today uh, five examples. Um, there are more applications, but I will focus on this. I will start with a classical experiment with optical tweezers. It's a tether pulling experiment. OK. So this uh, is this data. This is courtesy of, of Michael Crick's lab from the Institute of Photonic Sciences. In this case, we have a fluorescent bead that is optically trapped. And we will move it towards the axon of a neuron. And when we will pull it away, and a membrane tether is formed between the axon and the microsphere. So as you can see in this video, uh, the uh, microsphere you can see it here, 
follows a back and forth movement and we are increasing the velocity for each subsequent step. You can see it here from the uh, track position signal. This is the back and forth movement and you can see that the slope is increasing. This means that we are increasing the velocity, meaning that we are increasing the pulling rate. If you look at the force data, you can see the force peaks here are increasing when the pulling rate is increased. And you can see here now when the trap is static, the relaxation of the force. And uh, the researchers uh, can apply different models to fit this relaxation here in order to assess the mechanical properties of this action. The same kind of experiments was carried out with HeLa cancer cells. In this case, you can see the cell here. Here you can see the microsphere. And perhaps you can see the membrane tether here. In this case, uh, I am showing you the data for two different experiments. In blue, you can see the high pulling rate experiment. In, uh, in red color, you can see a low pulling rate experiment. Okay, You can see it from the slope different slopes here. If you look at the force data, you will see that the peak forces for the high pulling rate experiment are much higher than the peak forces obtained for the low pulling rate experiment. However, the relaxation is more or less the same in, in both cases. Again, this kind of, of experiments allow the researchers from Michael Kirk's lab to assess the mechanical properties of the memory. OK, so now let's move to the second application, motor protein activity. Uh, this is a typical application of optical choosers done in in vitro conditions, but I will show you data uh, obtained in in vivo conditions. So we use the system to trap lipid droplets in collaboration with Mario Montes from the University of Barcelona inside A549 cells. And here you can see um, a video of uh, vesicle trapping and manipulation inside a, inside a living cell, okay? And we did this with lipid droplets in A549 cells, which are lung cancer cells, okay? And um, these lipid droplets are being carried out by uh, protein motors. And you can see here the, the force uh, signal that we obtained for a particular experiment, uh, where you can see uh, how the force increases this is the force that the optical trap is exerting on the lipid droplet and you can see that the force increases until it reaches a certain plateau around seven piconewtons which is the style force known for a kinesin motor when we reach this uh, amount of force the kinesin motor is detached from the microtubule filament and then the force drops down to zero okay so this was measured inside these cells and but you can do more than that. You can look at the rich interplay of two different protein motors at the same time, pulling on the same cargo. So here I'm showing you two examples, a cooperation scenario where two kinesin motors are pulling on a lipid droplet along the same filament in the same direction. And now you can look at the parallel component of the force. This means the, for the component of the force that is parallel to this filament and you can see a, a plateau at seven piconewtons, the stall force of one kinesin, and another plateau at 14 piconewtons, which means that here we have two kinesin motors pulling at the same time. Okay, for the perpendicular component of the force, it's a zero for the experiment. Again, okay? you can see here the histogram of the forces with the peak at zero force, seven piconewtons, and 40 piconewtons. If you look at this scenario here, we have a competition between two different kinds of motors pulling on the same cargo, but on different filaments uh, with different directions. So if you look now at the parallel and the perpendicular component of the force, you don't see these plateaus, but you see these peaks going up and down, meaning that there is a competition between these two kinds of motors. And if you plot uh, the force in the y direction and the x direction in this graph here, you can see the back and forth movement of the cargo along the two filament directions. Okay, again, this is done inside a living uh, lung cancer cell. Okay, so let's talk about active microbiology. This is a built-in routine in the system. Um, you can use this routine to assess the uh, 
viscoelastic properties of different materials. Uh, in this case, I am showing an example of a polyacrylamide gel, or hydrogel, uh, where you have some microspheres embedded in it, and you trap one of these microspheres and you apply an oscillation at the tunable frequency. You can see the video here of the uh, one of these uh, particles trapped and the oscillations. So you apply different oscillations during an active phase and during an passive phase, you look at the Brownian motion of the particle. Okay, and you can then do subsequent step changing the, the frequency. So from this analysis, you can predict the viscosity of a viscose media, like for instance, a water glycerol mixture. In this case, we measure the viscosity with the system and we see that it, uh, the concordance with the predicted viscosity is very good. Uh, you can predict the viscosity by knowing the content of glycerol. If you look, for instance, at the value here for 0% of glycerol, this is the, uh, the viscosity of pure water at room temperature, which is around 9 per 10 to the minus 3 pascals per second. So you can do the same thing with uh, viscoelastic material like polyacrylamide gels, and you can now uh, extract the complex shear moduli of this material. You can uh, go up to stiffnesses as high as several kilopascals and look at the frequency behavior of G' prima and G2' prima, uh, with respect of the frequency, uh, two frequencies of more than 10 kilohertz. So we did the same kind of experiments inside uh, living cells. In this case, uh, the samples were provided by uh, Marielle Monatit from Collège de France and Jean Lemaitre from Institut Curie. And we did this uh, test inside uh, the cytoplasm of a living oocyte. And this is the data for one experiment and the same thing inside the cytoplasm of our mouse early embryo. Okay, so let's talk about nuclear mechanics. Um, here I am going to show you how um, researchers from the Center of Genomic Regulation in collaboration with the Institute of Photonic Science um, used the sensor cell system to indent uh, cell nuclei. In this case, they used several fish stem cells. You can see the confocal image of one of the cells here. Uh, they uh, internalized microspheres in the cell. This is a one microsphere. Okay. And they trapped this microsphere with the sensor cell optical users and they applied uh, a trajectory in order to indent the cell nucleus. You can see this is the microsphere, it's a fluorescent bit here, and you can see that it will move up and down, and this is the nucleus being indented. Okay, so from this experiment, they got data in two different conditions where the cells were in suspension or when the cells were confined. The confinement was a confinement of 10 microns. So you can see here the trap movement. It's now indenting the cell nucleus. It stays there uh, for a while and then it goes away. And you can see here uh, the force signal normalized to the indentation of the nucleus. And this is a close-up of the, of the relaxation here, okay? And you can see the same data for the confined experiment. Uh, the researchers um, did uh, some fittings of this relaxation here, and they got the uh, characteristic decay time of uh, the, this uh, relaxation process here for the suspension uh, cells and the confined cells. And they did the same with uh, the plateau of the force reach here for the suspension and the confined cells. Okay. Uh, this work has been published uh, recently in Science uh, by Venturini et al. Okay. Similarly, we did some tests uh, with samples provided by uh, Mathieu Piel's lab from Institut Curie with HILA cancer cells and human retina cells. Uh, you can see here the nuclei of the cells that are labeled with epifluorescence. And we use these internalized bits. These are three micron bits to indent the cell nucleus. And this is one of the experiments. You can see the trap position here and the force signal 
okay? And if we look at the relaxation here, we can see the data for the HeLa cancer cell and the uh, retina uh, cell. Okay, again, um, some fittings can be uh, applied here for the relaxation in order to uh, extract the mechanical properties of the, of the nuclei. Okay, so let's move to the last uh, application example, immune cells interaction. In this example has been done in collaboration with Carlos Partia from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And I will show you an experiment using two cells, a cancer cell and a T cell. These two cells are optically trapped and we will move the T cell towards the cancer cell. And we will, move, we will wait for 10 seconds to see if there has been any kind of recognition between these two cells. And then we will pull the T cell back and we will measure if there has been any addition force. Okay, so this is what we see here. This is the cancer cell, this is the T cell. And now we will move the T cell towards the cancer cell. The force is initially zero. And now we wait for uh, around 10 seconds and we will pull the T cell back. And you will see that the force will start decreasing because there has been some kind of interaction here. Okay, so we start increasing the force, we pull, pull and pull until we reach amount of force that is capable of breaking the bond. So this difference here is giving you the addition force between the two cells. In this case, we measured around 21 piconewtons, which is the force that we would expect for a single T cell receptor. So now you can uh, do this using uh, different engineered T cells expressed in different receptors and uh, using different target cells. And uh, we have done this in collaboration with the immunotherapy department of the hospital clinic in Barcelona. I can not disclose the receptors that we were measuring, but the idea here is that you can distinguish uh, between uh, real affinity of uh, different engineered T cells with respect to a target cell, okay? So this is more or less what I wanted to show you today regarding the applications. I will now end with a summary of the system highlights. So I haven't mentioned it before. The system comes with a single frequency laser. It's a 5 baht 1064 nanometer laser. We can generate multiple, multiple traps up to 256 traps, thanks to its acousto-optic deflection beam steering technology. And we can measure the forces on these, uh, on these uh, 256 traps simultaneously, okay? We have the click and drag trapping mode, but we can also program arbitrary trajectories, oscillations, or even uh, do pattern morphing. We can measure forces inside cells and tissues. We can trap and measure on non-spherical objects. We can measure forces in the X and Y plane and in the Z direction. The sampling frequency is 25 kilohertz. We have custom built-in routines like active microbiology. We can apply also force clamping, for instance. And you can, users can also uh, create their own routines using our software development kit. And the system is compatible with a wide variety of imaging techniques like bright field, Face construct, epifluorescent, or confocal imaging. Well, um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and uh, we are now ready for the QA session, I guess. Thanks a lot, Oreo, for the presentation. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions, but if you have any questions, feel free to uh, write it on the chat and we will be answering them directly um, on live. So um, we have a question uh, from Anna. Uh, she's asking, uh, which is the range of forces that you can explore with such power if it's below 200 milliwatts? If it's below uh, 200 milliwatts, yeah. Um, Arnau, can you answer? Yeah, in fact, I was, I was, um, I was typing. Uh, 
uh, right now. Um, so it's it's difficult to to tell because it it really depends a lot on on the sample itself. So without further details, it's it's very difficult to give a precise um, answer. Um, so the typical values for uh, for example the trap stiffness um, is a one piconewton per micron per milliwatt. So that gives uh, below uh, up to 200 milliwatts, that's 200 piconewtons per micron. If you can typically move the particle uh, half a micron, then that's 100 piconewtons. So that's a very rough estimate, but um, without without more details, it's it's more it's difficult to, to tell anything else. Th that will surely depend on the size of the particle you are. The particle and that whether it's it's in a cell or it's in a buffer. I mean, it's very difficult. It's very different trapping uh, synthetic particles like microspheres in, in water or trapping uh, an endogenous structure in the cell, right? Because of the of the refractive index mismatch. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you work in vitro with microspheres, then uh, forces tend to be in, in that order. I mean, for uh, uh, 200 milliwatts, it's around 100 piconewtons. I mean, order of magnitude. Uh, in the cell, that, that will be uh, much lower, of course, because the, the refractive index mismatch is, is, is lower. Yeah. And um, we have one more, we have one more interesting question, like, is it possible to manipulate the sample, for example, flow small molecules while performing measurements? <clears throat> uh, yeah, so, so the, the thing is, um, um i think um that the 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 question was more about the or um i i think she was asking for the integration with microfluidics um if if that's the question um the the system is uh, compatible with uh, a microfluid device but um it doesn't include it okay so so it, um that the the sensor cell has no microfluidics um, if, if the question is more about uh, trapping molecules themselves, uh, that, that's, that's not possible, okay? Uh, unless they are uh, huge molecules, in general, it's not possible trapping, uh, trapping molecules. Uh, they are too small, so the forces that we can attain uh, with the light are too low to keep the molecule in the trap. Uh, that's not specific for our system, but uh, for the technique, for optical tweezers in general. Okay. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, the need to collect all the light transmitted, uh, to, uh, all of the transmitted light seems to uh, limit, limit the sample thickness. How much space do you have between the trapping objective and the condenser? Hmm. Um, yeah, so... so um, we use a, 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 a long working distance uh, lens for the for the collecting lens. Okay, so for the lens um, in the sensor, um, and that that's that means around a couple of millimeters. Okay, <clears throat> that means that we have some space, and uh, there is a, a let's say a requirement in the thickness of the chamber just to be able to capture. Um, enough light because basically light is propagating with different with a different angle in the sample where, where we have water and in in the oil the the, the lens that we use uh, for the sensor is an, an immersion an oil immersion lens so in the oil the angle is is smaller but in water because it's it's um, it's larger we need to keep it uh, uh, thin I mean and the, the sample must be uh, Typically, the half a millimeter is the maximum thickness. Okay, uh, we use. I mean, for for most of the experiments we use, it's 100 microns, 200 microns is the typical thickness. Uh, we've done experiments with embryos uh, using uh, chambers uh, up to uh, 600 microns. Okay, it works. It's, it it doesn't work so well. I mean, there's uh, a certain um, error in the in the measurement, so the, the accuracy of the measurement changes a bit. It's it's a small small error, but it affects that. Um, we if you keep it down to five hundred microns, around half a millimeter is is is, is fine. Okay. 
it's it's okay. I know. Um, one more question we just received: How easy it is to measure the force yeah. in the z-axis? Yeah. So, so the thing is, uh, uh, the system um, uh, allows. I mean, the system as 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 is allows only measuring measuring forces in in the plane, so in x and y. Okay. Uh, we have uh, an accessory that allows you to measure in in z. Okay. Uh, but um, using the same the same uh, technology that uh, Uriol, Uriol discussed at the at the beginning of the session, um, the only thing is that then uh, you cannot measure x and y, or the error in the in, in the x and y uh, are large. So either you measure in x and y, or you measure in z. So if you want to do some pulling in z. Um, we have this accessory that you can that you can get, uh, or if you want to measure in the plane, you you use the system um, uh, in the normal configuration where you measure in x and y. Yeah. If you need to measure in three dimensions, so in x, y, and z, uh, then uh, the quality of the measurement in x and y is, is not so good. But in principle, we we allow that. I mean, it's 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 feasible. And you can you can measure also in Z. In introducing this accessory to do uh, Z force measurements is quite straightforward. It's done mm -hmm. in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, um, is the software open source? Um, I asked to see how much access users have to customizing the application. Mm -hmm. the, the software is not an open source software, but uh, we, we provide all the tools uh, for the users to generate their own routines. In a very specific, you just need uh, some basic knowledge of LabVIEW in order to create your own routines and to program your routines uh, to generate your, uh, your experiments. Uh, so you can control all the features all the features of the sensor cell system using the functions that we already provide you. Okay, so you just need to combine them in order to create your routine. Great. Any last questions? We're, we're coming to the end of the webinar in terms of time. I can see here someone asked about the maximum laser power. Uh, yes, I, I already answered that. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's so it's the the I can repeat the the, the answer. So it's, so the maximum power uh, typically at the sample is uh, slightly above one bar. Depends on the system itself in the specific system, but it's uh, around one bar. <clears throat> okay. um, I don't think we have uh, any more questions and we're kind of uh, running out of the time. Um, thank you everyone for attending the webinar and we will follow up with you uh, with emails. Um, and uh, if you want the presentation, uh, that will be also included in the emails as well. Um, we have one, one, one more question. Uh, is the system compatible with all microscope platforms? No, the system uh, is compatible with uh, Nikon microscopes. We offer the system uh, together with the microscope. Okay. Oh, so it comes with... Uh, the latest TI, uh, TI2 inverted microscope from Nikon. Great. Um, all right. Um, well, right. thanks again for um, joining the webinar and we will follow up. Okay, thanks. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye.